Sarah Rogop clearly remembers the day when the thing she feared most happened. It was the last um, week that I was thought that I would be pregnant, and um, it was a Sunday night, and we had both fallen asleep, and it was about midnight that I just woke up. I wasn't in pain. Something just didn't feel right inside of my, my body, inside my heart. I just knew something was not right. And so I got up and I spent the entire night um, till about 5 a.m. trying to get the baby to move, just doing everything that I could think of to get baby to move. And by 5 a.m. Um, was not successful. And at that point, um, I began to, to panic and um, had done spent a lot of time throughout the night praying and pleading with the Lord. And so about 5 a.m. I woke Mark up and I said, I've been up all night. I've been trying to get the baby to move and I can't get the baby to move and something does not seem right. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Surrender, The Heart God Controls. For April 24th, 2023, I'm Dana Gresh. You know, when tragedy strikes or we face suffering and loss, how do we deal with our grief? Is it okay to lament? Aren't we supposed to be joyful all the time? We're about to explore these questions with Mark Vrogop. He's been on Revive Our Hearts before with his wife, Sarah, whom we just heard from. Mark is lead pastor of College Park Church in the Indianapolis area and a good friend to Revive Our Hearts. Here's Nancy to start off the conversation. Mark, as we were listening to that clip that we aired several years ago on Revive Our Hearts, I heard you just take a deep breath, just a sigh. And I know that brings back unbelievable memories for you. You don't forget it, do you? No, you don't. You know, someone compared loss like an amputation. It heals, but you have something that's missing in your life. And to hear my wife's voice and the recollection of what that moment was like, it's a flood of emotions, both of gratitude for God's faithfulness, but also the reality is life is really hard. And that five o'clock in the morning conversation was the start of a really hard, dark journey for you and Sarah. We've talked about it before on Revive Our Hearts, but give us a kind of overview of what happened in those next hours. Yeah, after my wife told me that something was wrong, I immediately fell to my knees and just cried out to the Lord. And I said, Lord, please, not this. Just sensing that uh, we needed his help and also a great level of fear of what might be in front of us. Eventually, we made our way to the hospital and it was confirmed that our daughter inside the womb had passed away. She died. We were just a few days before delivery. And uh, then my poor wife had to go through delivery of a child that wasn't alive but fully formed. Sylvia was her name, and she was nine pounds. And um, mm-hmm. that set us into a, a long journey of grief that was just unbelievable and yet also very, very instructive. It shaped uh, our understanding of ministry, of loss, and also what it really means to lament. And it was one major part of a series of losses that you and Sarah experienced in relation to childbearing. Yeah, little did we know that was only the beginning. One of the scariest things about grief is the fear that it won't go away or that something will happen again. And there were multiple miscarriages, a false positive pregnancy, moments when, frankly, we wondered, God, are you mean? Like, what, what is going on? And then all of the emotions connected with that that we're trying to think through, knowing that God isn't mean. But When you're in the midst of uh, a dark valley of suffering, there are just really challenging questions that emerge. And then what do you do with those? And Mark, you and Sarah were not only walking through your own grief, your own heaviness of heart, but you're also a pastor. And you were shepherding people who were hurting, conducting funerals. You're walking with others through their grief. So you're dealing with your own, but also having to shepherd others with theirs. Yeah, that was the great irony and the really one of the most substantial pains was trying to figure out how every week do I care for hurting people, officiate at funerals, 
celebrate the birth of living children Mm -hmm. um, and also deal with this nagging sense of uh, grief that was just raging within my soul. Grief is not tame and it's not linear. And trying to figure out how to navigate our way through this wilderness was, uh, was a complicated and messy, frankly, activity for us. I've heard you tell about a night when you had a prayer time at your church. I'm not sure I'm describing it exactly, but you had opportunity for people to come and share their lament and their prayer of lament. We're going to talk more about that this week. But that night, it seemed like there were a number of women who were dealing with empty cribs, with empty arms, with unfulfilled hopes or dreams as it related to childbearing. And I think a lot of our listeners can relate to that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. The, I mean, the pains of life are innumerable, but in particular, the pain connected to the desire for children, the loss of children. It just, and that's part of our story is that as we began to talk about this, people from all walks of life in terms of pain came out of the woodwork, but especially those who've walked through difficult seasons related to mis- miscarriage and infertility or failed adoptions. And yeah, in the context of a prayer gathering with our staff, I invited them to um, just come to a, kind of a middle of a, of a circle and to read a lament that they had written to the Lord about what kind of pains that they were uh, working through. And uh, yeah, it was a remarkable moment of just uh, candor and gut level honesty Uh, For example, here's one person said, How long, O Lord, will you forget me? How long will you withhold the blessing of a child from us? How long will we cry to you? How many more days, months, or years will pass with our arms remaining empty? How much longer will we struggle to rejoice with those who rejoice while we sit weeping? But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Thank you, Father. And that's quite a progression there. We're going to talk about the progression of lament and as found in many of the Psalms. But sometimes I think we have this understanding of Christianity, of the gospel, that it means when we go through these crises that there's no place for that gut-wrenching, heartfelt, deep, agonizing pain and grief. And maybe some in our churches who are going through that feel like they don't have a safe place to express that because we're, after all, supposed to rejoice in all things. And we have Christ. So is there maybe this unspoken sense that we're not supposed to grieve or lament? We're supposed to be bigger than that. We're supposed to be able to have peace in the midst of that. How do you start to reconcile these things? Yeah, I think that for sure is the experience of many people who are walking through deep pain and they struggle with kind of two ditches, either the despair ditch, which is I can't do this and I might not even be a Christian because of the things that I'm wrestling with, where they have a real crisis of faith or denial and people just pretend as though everything is okay. And part of that is just because if if a person in, who's grieving is like gut level honest about what they're really wrestling with, and some of the, even their questions about God's purposes, invariably most people, at least in my experience, who are not grieving are either very uncomfortable with that or send pretty clear cues that either A, I don't want you to talk this way, or B, I'm not even sure it's appropriate for you to be feeling this. And yet the grieving person is feeling that. And so it just, there is this sort of undercurrent assumption, I think, within many of our churches, our music and our writing, that we we have to be happy. We have to be triumphant. Mm -hmm. And granted, we want to end in a place where we're triumphant and end in a place where we are rejoicing. That's not the issue. The issue is how do you get there? And I think not a lot of people understand what that journey is can look like biblically. Did you find as you and Sarah were walking through your valley and your loss that there were those who struggled to understand how deeply you felt this? Oh, for sure. I, yeah. And and I don't blame them. It's just, it's part of the internal grief at a different level when either people move on, which is understandable, and you're left with this lonely wound that you're trying to figure out how to navigate through Or there's this just foreboding sense that people just don't fundamentally understand. And it puts you in a a pretty lonely position that I think the scriptures can speak into that 
And there is a language for those kind of moments if we'll embrace it. I would think that you and Sarah minister differently to friends, loved ones, church members since walking through this journey or as you've been walking through this journey than you did before you had that experience. Oh, yeah. In, in a way, frankly, that I just am at one level profoundly thankful to the Lord for. We've often said, you know, I'm glad the Lord didn't give us a choice between a living child and all the lessons we've learned because I know I would have chosen the living child. Of course. And yet our the loss of our daughter and the subsequent issues after that really taught us how to walk with grieving and hurting people, what it's like just to be silent and be okay with that. And then as people understood either our story or our journey, just even our presence was meaningful, that the message wasn't through what we said. It was by sitting next to them on the morning bench and just being near and being close. And I think that's part of what this grief helped to teach us is this, how do you communicate to hurting and grieving people in a way that really speaks to their soul, sometimes without even speaking. Yeah. I've known you and Sarah all these years and watched you not only go through this, but watched God redeem it in your lives and bring beauty out of things that it looked like had no beauty attached to them. But that really was the beginning of a journey for you and Sarah in this whole thing called lament. It feels like a really old-fashioned word. You don't hear, that's not an everyday word that we use in our Christian language. But you've written a book on the subject of lament. It's something that at some point in our lives, every one of us needs this concept, this understanding of lament. It is, because life is filled with all kinds of sorrows and pains. And if you live long enough, you're going to suffer. And when you suffer, and if you're a follower of Jesus, and you know you need to land in trusting God's purposes and in his sovereignty, how do you get there? And I think lament is the language that helps you move from the poles of a hard life to trusting in God's sovereignty. And I also think that anybody can cry. To cry is human. We enter the world by crying. But to lament is inherently Christian. And so I think there's not only a place for helping people to know how to deal with their grief, but also realizing that of all the people on earth who ought to know how to lament, it ought to be people who know the redemptive arc of biblical history and the fact that we're waiting for the King of Kings to come and end all of our pain so that there'll be no more lament. Amen. Amen. Let it come. Amen. So, Mark, help us. What's the difference between just natural crying in a time of difficulty and Christian lament? Yeah. By definition, lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. So crying would simply be expressing sorrow. And there's nothing wrong with the expression of sorrow. Um, Our world is filled with all sorts of issues where we're mourning various losses. But what Christian lament is, is taking that pain and talking to God about it for the purpose of seeing it as a platform for worship as opposed of a pit of despair that I'm going to linger in. And so what lament is, it's a biblical language that allows us to move through our pain while talking to God, reinforcing what we believe to be true, and also being gut level honest about how much this hurts. And the language of lament, as you explain in this book, is drawn largely from the scripture and the Psalms. You know, when we think of the Psalms, my first thought is, this is praise, this is thanksgiving, this is lifting up worship to the Lord. And that's true, but I wasn't aware till I read it in your book that a third of the Psalms, that's approximately 50 of the Psalms, are lament Psalms. Was that a kind of surprising discovery to you? Yeah, just surprising discovery to me and nearly every person who I talk to about the Psalms, because Psalms is a go-to book for when we're hurting or when your soul just feels worn down, you go there, and you immediately assume, just like you did, that it's about praise and thanksgiving, and it certainly is, and yet, yeah, and it's at least a third of the Psalms are lament. Some argue that upwards to 50% of the Psalms have some sort of lament category internal to that uh, particular Psalm, and it just helps us to see that life is not only filled with hardship, but if we think about it, some of our best moments of worship, some of our best moments of trust have come in the darkest valleys. And so it just makes sense that the Bible would speak into the darkest of dark moments. And then when you see that that's there, it just helps you to know what to pray, how to pray, and gives you a great deal of hope and explains what it was that you were going through that at the time you probably didn't have a category for. 
One of the earliest psalms of lament in the psalm book is Psalm 13. And I wonder if you just read that psalm for us. We've probably heard it before, but it's probably not the first one we go to when we're hurting. And I think it illustrates so beautifully and poignantly the freedom we have and the maybe the duty to, in our times of dealing with injustice or pain or things not being right in this world— yet, to be honest with God as the psalmist was. So this is a prayer. It's a prayer of lament. And just to give us a feel of of that category of psalms in the scripture, would you just read that for us? Mm, Happy to. It's one of my favorites. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Lift up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. That's Psalm 13. And in just the space of six verses there, we go from, count them, one, two, three, four, how long? How long, O Lord? That's, you know, this crisis of faith, this, I don't know if I can endure this any longer. When are you going to do something about this situation? You read about sleeping the sleep of death, enemies prevailing, foes rejoicing, being shaken. That's the crisis. And then it turns the corner. And before he's done this prayer, he's come to trusting in the steadfast love of God. And tomorrow we're going to unpack some of the the ingredients, the components in these Psalms of Lament. But I think just for the moment to point out that these things, this honest crying out to the Lord and this steadfast hope in the Lord can coexist, that they can be in the same heart and in the same prayer. Yeah. They not only can coexist, they should coexist because in their coexistence, they actually platform something really beautiful about Christianity, which is that in the midst of the darkest moment, there are equal truths that simply exist um, next to one another, that hard is really hard and yet hard is not bad, that my life is not what I expected it to be and yet God is so incredibly good. And that's why the word but I have trusted in your mercy. That word, but every lament turns on a word like that, that this is all true, but God is good. This is really hard, but God is faithful. What happens if we skip the, this is really hard part? If we try to just force ourselves or others to jump to the, I trust in your mercy, your steadfast love, but we don't take time to voice the lament part. What does that do to us? I think that it makes the level of trust that we're really able to experience shallow Mm -hmm. compared to when you're able to plumb the depths of your pain and to realize that every depth of what I've felt, God is able to meet me there. There's no place that pain can lead me that Jesus can't show up in. And so I think the more honest we are, and frankly, those aren't surprising words to God. Our honesty doesn't take him by surprise, Mm -hmm. doesn't inform him about anything, Mm -hmm. but it reminds me, God can go the distance with me in my pain. And that's one of the things grieving people want to know. Is there hope not just for today, but is there hope like for the next number of years? Because what happens if this happens again? Or what happens if this gets worse? And by going to a point where we are able to really voice the depth of our pain, we're able to find that even then, God shows up and can meet our needs. We can trust him. You've called your book on lament, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, Discovering the Grace of Lament. The Dark Clouds and Deep Mercy concept came from a book about lament called Lamentations there in our Old Testament. And you see the two, the dark clouds and the deep mercy juxtaposed together, even as you do in this psalm. Just talk about in your own experience how the dark clouds and the deep mercy come together. You know, the beautiful thing about the book of Lamentations is it's a memorial that's meant to remind us that even when the worst of the worst happens, when 
In Israel's case, Jerusalem is sacked, the temple is ruined, the people have been put into exile. When those dark clouds loom, that's when Jeremiah pronounces the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And in this case, in Lamentations, it's not only circumstantial or grief that's been caused unrelated to people's sin issues in Lamentations. It's actually a direct connection. The brokenness of the world, the brokenness of the nation has now created this moment. And even when we've created our own grief, Mm -hmm. when we've created our own calamity, even still, Mm -hmm. God's steadfast love, his mercy never ceases. And so that's where that dark cloud and deep mercy juxtaposition is really important for us to think about as we make our way through difficult moments, some of which have been caused by our own sinfulness, some of which are caused because of the sinfulness of the world, and some of which are just part of what it means to be a human being living in a world that's tragically affected by the consequences of sin. And yet, that is being redeemed by Mm -hmm. a God of deep mercy. You may find yourself today in a place of dark clouds and not sure where to turn, how to cry out, how to express the pain you're feeling. Or you may have friends or family members, church members, people in your workplace who are themselves under dark clouds, and you're not sure how to minister grace to them. This is a really helpful resource. It's a topic we don't talk enough about. And I want to encourage you to read Mark Frogop's book, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, and to discover the grace of lament. We're going to talk more about that in the next program, how lament can be a means of grace in our lives. When you lead me to the valley of vision, I can see you. Let me learn that the cross precedes the crown to be So for more information about how to get a copy of Pastor Mark's book, you'll find a link in the transcript of today's episode at reviveourhearts.com. Nancy damas Walgamuth and Pastor Mark Rogop have been explaining the concept of lament. They've done it by taking us back to Scripture. God's Word gives us a foundation for seeking Him in prayer. Whatever season of life you're in, God has provided the perfect template to enter into conversation with Him, and that is His Word. In the new book, Finding the Words to Pray, discover how to pray God's Word back to Him. The subtitle is 50 Scriptures to Guide Your Prayers. It's a great tool to help you be intentional with prayer and voice your longings to the Lord. This beautiful book from Revive Our Hearts also includes space to write down your own thoughts and responses along with several true saturated prayers from Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth. When you donate any amount to support this ministry, you'll receive a copy of Finding the Words to Pray. It's our way to say thanks. 
Visit our website, reviveourhearts.com, or call us at 1-800-569-5959, and be sure to request your copy. That's 1-800-569-5959. As Pastor Mark learned, lament is a journey. It's a process. And as we read the Psalms, we find that there are components or stages of lament. Be sure and join us tomorrow for Revive Our Hearts when we talk more about the journey of lament. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth wants you to experience freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.